So I'll take, uh, we're taking just a, a minute's pause. I feel like I should have um, elevator music, some music to, to fill these empty spaces, just so that we can get ourselves to the, to the, the top of the hour, the start of the next session. For those of you that are looking forward to um, to Juan Miguel's talk, uh, we've not actually heard uh, from him whether he's having difficulty joining us backstage or not. We've not had him join us backstage. So if somebody happens to know Juan Miguel Gonzalez Aranda, let him know that we're looking forward to him still joining us if he's able. Um, and there's various um, organizers ready to help with any tech issues that it might be popping up. So I think I think I'll go ahead and introduce you, if I may, Flavia. I I see that you've got um, a screen ready to go. I don't know if you wanted to get PowerPoint start. There we go. We've got PowerPoint fired up. Fantastic. Um, Flavia is a, a, a PhD in physical geography, specializing in remote sensing from the University of uh, Göttingen in Germany. She has more than 14 years of remote sensing experience in renowned research institutes on optical and SAR sensors. And her expertise lies in forest agriculture and land use change in tropical forests. She's uh, currently G GIS and remote sensing analyst at the Remote Sensing Solutions in Munich. And she's going to talk to us today about um, open remote, remote sensing data to analyze the effectiveness of payments for ecosystem services in the Sofala community carbon project. I'm really looking forward to hearing about this Mozambique use case. I hand over to you to tell us all about it. Thank you very much for your very nice introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you everyone and also thank you the FOS4G and the support of the group uh, of, of Earth Observation, the GEO, to try to make this very nice event, more gender diversity and also topic diversity because today in our session, I was learning a lot and making a lot of notes because after, of course, after the session, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions to my colleagues, to my speaker colleagues. So um, saying that, I would like to introduce then the topic uh, that I would like to, to, to introduce a little bit today. It's a part of, uh, part of the result of this, the project that we have. It's a multidisciplinary project. And the title of my presentation today, as Margareta already said, it's open remote sensing data to analyze the effectiveness of payment for ecosystem service in the Sofala community carbon project in Mozambique. But first, let's talk a little bit about the project. So it's a project collaboration project between the University of Marburg and also the agricultural institution in Mozambique. And the name is Impacted. So the impact of terminated payment for ecosystem service on carbon stock, deforestation, collective actions, and intrinsic motivations for conservation. So as you can see in the title, it's a little bit multidisciplinary. So the, the University of Marburg are responsible for, of course, uh, leading the the whole project and also focus on the social economical analysis of the payment ecosystem service and then the group in mozambique are responsible for all the the field work campaigns and also the the analysis uh, together with us and which who are responsible for the remote sensing part of this project in mozambique the analysis of this project in mozambique but what exactly payment for ecosystem service so Payment for ecosystem service, um, I could call an instrument or maybe a market-based mechanism which try to help changing the practice of people who are doing damage activities, such as cutting down the trees for charcoal production. So as you can see here, a group of people who do uh, deforestation for carbon production. So they sell, of course, uh, everything that they deforestate. So instead of that, this local community could receive incentives to protect <clears throat> to protect the forest in their area and also plant the agroforest system. So that's the idea 
the general, let's say, one, one of the parts of the idea for the ecosystem service to, uh, to protect, of course, the, the environmental area around this region, but also give some resource for this community, which mostly, I mean, when you, when you think about underdeveloping country like Brazil or like Mozambique, mostly are financially more complicated, let's say, than compared to the rich countries. And I believe that the payment for ecosystem service could potentially potentially also play an important role in the adaptation to climate change reducing, uh, reducing the vulnerability of the ecosystem. So today we see a lot of news and we see also a lot of uh, initiatives regarding the the, the market of the carbon credit or some, for example, companies and also institution is studying and analyzing the supply chain of um, of a company or of a, of a of farmer and, and everything. And so this is a, a, I think it's a very relevant topic for the actual days. We just had a, a, a an event, I think two weeks ago in New York to talk more a lot about this Paris Agreement and so on. So I believe that this is a, it plays an important role inside of all these contests that we are talking about climate change. Um, and I would like to show you, um, a little bit more about the payment ecosystem service in the area where we are going to see. So in general, in this area, there are three kinds of sources. So the first is the individual contracts, which is um, they do individual contracts, uh, they call agroforest contracts to with the farmers. So they, they, they pay the farmers to plant the agroforest systems and to keep the, the, the trees there and in preserving the trees, doing the management and keeping them up to stock carbon. Other kind of source that this project also generated uh, is related to jobs, rela uh, jobs which are indirectly created by the project because you need to manage you need to do administrative administrative work and you need to 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 anyway to 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 do all the infrastructure of the project and also you have the red plus component uh, in this case for example they were they were paying a money to not to the person or to the farmers trade but they were giving the money to um, to like a budget of the community where they could use this money, for example, to build school, to get a better health infrastructure and to change infrastructure in general for the people there. So for the Red Plus, they, for example, were doing initiatives in early burning. So early burning, usually practice, they, they do that to reduce the number and the heat intensity, for example, of wind or late season fires. Also patrolling, for example, so they were like uh, going around the region to see if the forest that were there were still stand, if there was anyone trying to cut down the trees. So they were also doing, let's say, the safety of the forest and also fire breaks. I will give you a very short overview on the project timeline. So the project started in 2003, the pilot project. And then uh, some farmers were already doing contracts. And then in 2006, uh, they started the red component inside of this project. And then in the 2008, we have the end of the pilot, uh, the, the pilot phase uh, that they started in 2003. Then in 2009 was the last year, actually, 2009, 2010, that uh, the new contracts uh, were signed. And from 2011, we have no new contract signed. And also after this year, we started to not have so much information like when we were having with annual reports. And, and then in 2014, they decided to close the business, unfortunately. And then we decided to try to analyze what is happening between all these years before and also after the project. Therefore, the objective of this uh, big project impacted is to propose a project uh, that will evaluate several long-term aspects, so before, during, and after the project in the payment ecosystem service in Mozambique in the Sofala region. So we have then two, let's say, main objectives. Uh, one is the environmental effectiveness uh, respect to deforestation, carbon for, for 
carbon sequestration, land use change or the land use. And the second one, uh, it's more a social economical analysis. And that's what I really like about this project because of course we cannot explain everything with remote sensing and we are always missing not only few data, but also economical and social aspects. They make a huge difference and then make us to better understand all the all the contest and the impact of our remote sensing analysis analysis but today i'm going to focus of course on the environmental uh, perspective of this work so let's go to mozambique now not on the beach that i heard they're very beautiful but in the countryside of the country so and um, our study area it's more or less in the center of mozambique in the sofala region and here I'm going to show you the area where we were really analyzing. So you can see a Sentinel-2 image from the from May 2019. So this whole area that you are seeing with the Sentinel-2 image is a study area. And the polygonal with the red lines is the Sofala Community Carbon Project, where the the, the agroforest systems and where the project was implemented. So we chose a big area, of course, to try to understand what is going on inside of the area of the carbon project and also outside and see if we can see any impact. So the remote sensing part has three main tasks. So first of all is the land use and the land use change mapping in the year of 1996, 2002. 2019 and why we chose this uh, this year is not only of course availability of image but principally because one was before one was when the project started and when one was when the project ended and in the second task uh, which we are right now we are mapping mapping the agroforest systems in this region and the third task is to do the uh, carbon storage assimilation and try to estimate the carbon storage in uh, once we identify all these agroforest systems that we are trying to map in the second task so now i'm going to talk about this first um a task so we were mapping diverse, uh, many different land use. So as you can see, normal forest, agriculture, also some distance, because sometimes you have to understand, for example, that if you have a national park around a region, the probability of having less deforestation, in this case, it's a, of course a little bit higher because the park is usually protected. So you can see that at least in the border of the, the, the park, you have you should have less deforestation. And also distant to the closest ro world, we know that uh, I think Amazon in Brazil, it's the biggest example that we can really see this, uh, they call, uh, uh, I think, spine fish, when you can really see a road and then you see the deforestation going in a vertical way and, it, and it's very clear that the road plays also a big, uh, uh, a big role in this and also the urban areas. And the second task, uh, as I said, it's the agroforest system. But today we're gonna focus more on the land use change and the, and the land use and land use change, and mostly in wood forest, wood, woodland forest and deforestation. So for that, we needed to have open source free data which thank to Landsat 5, Landsat 7, and Landsat 8 uh, that we were able to use to do all the time series and all the long-term impact analysis. And that's here we have to highlight the importance of the open data and not only in a context, for example, of an institution, uh, a governmental institution, but also in the private sector, we see that uh, ever this, this is a, big advantage, let's say, of using uh, this open data source to do this long-term effect analysis. Um, so we were um, using, we had three um, image, satellite image from March. So we try to keep the same month as this region has a strong seasonality. A savanna, it's a, it's a very rich biome with a strong seasonality with fires, with, with, with periods of drought and, and so on. And we were doing the maps um, with a 30 meter spatial resolution. So taking this data, we did a object 
object-based land approach classification. So, and, and usually they are hierarchical classification rule set and the classification, for example, was, was able to differentiate nine classes and it's also based on decision rules. So I think what is very interesting about object-based, I know that uh, there are some really new techniques with uh, AI we are also using here, um, uh, pixel-based, uh, I think we still have some uh, advantage and I think we can always use also the object-based or even merge both uh, techniques. And But I, what I really like about this is the, in the segmentation that you can, for example, in this program without programming, without uh, with a deep knowledge of writing codes, you can really give a power to different layers. So for example, if I have the band one, and if I have the band three or four or the any DVI layer, uh, let's say that the, play, the band one plays a, a not such important role in the forest classification uh, compared to the any DVI, for example. So I could give, a, let's say, a, a bigger power to the any DVI layer. So the segmentation will try to delineate all the object, uh, take into account more uh, layers that are more important and have a higher contribution to the forest cover, for example. And there we go for the first results, for the first task. So here we have a land use a map from the 1996. You can see that the object-based uh, classification was able to identify nine classes. And here we see that also we have a, a good forest and woodland cover. Already a lot of croplands in the south, but a good woodland cover. So when we go to the year of 2002, we already have a big loss in the vegetation and also an increase in the cropland, the grassland complex. But when you go, we go to the 2019, we even see a big loss, a bigger loss. So in the in the woodland and, and forest area. So what I have done was a just quick um, analysis on this land use change that was happened. So <clears throat> you can see here that 43% that we, re here we have a comparison between the year of 1996 and 2009. So the whole time series that we were, analysis, we were analyzing. And here you can see that 43% of the woodland, of the, the woodland forest areas in this, in this year, it still remain forest in 2019. But 46% of the forest area in 1996 turn it into cropland and nine into bushland. So if we analyze then before the project was implemented to after when the project was implemented, maybe we could see some difference, right? In the how the land use change, maybe the land use change could have had an impact uh, with the project in this area. So here we did an, an, an analysis. So we could see that 52% of the forests in 1996 it still was a forest in 2002, but 38% of the forest in 1996 turned into cropland and nine into sh and shrub and bushland. So if we go to the comparison after the project, the payment ecosystem service was installed, we see that 79% of the forest in 2002 remained forest in 2019 and 20% turned it into cropland and grasslands and 1% shrublands. So here we already see some difference. We can maybe started to draw some conclusion or started to feed our analysis. Uh, but now to give a short conclusion, the first task, uh, we did also uh, deforestation analysis here and we were analyze, an analyzing the deforestation rate per year and also in two different periods, as you can see from 1996 to 2002, the blue, the legend, and from 2002 to 2019. So the first one, the blue, is before the project, and the orange one, it's after the project. And here we can see this graphic, which shows the hectares and also the different areas. So as I said, we were not only doing in the Sofala project area, which in the image in the in the right side you can see by the red shape file, but also the study area around. So we could see that in both cases we have a a decrease of the, 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 the deforestation, let's say. So 63% of the total deforestation that happens between 1996 and 2000, 63% of the total deforestation happened between the 1996 and 2002, and 37 between 2002 and 2018 in the study area, so in the biggest area. 
and 52% of the total deforestation happened between that happened between 1996 and 2002 in the study area as you can see the area with the with the red shape file and 48 percent between 2002 and 2019 even with the non-signing of the new contracts from 2011 and the finalization the end of the the, the project in 2014 it was still possible to see that there is, let's say, a downward trend in deforestation in the project region and also in the surrounding. And now let's go to the last task, the task two. So here uh, I'm going to talk what we are doing regarding agroforest systems. So there is a lot of challenge regarding the agroforest system mapping because, as you know, we have the, the usually the agroforest systems in some regions. They are very located. They are dispersed. They are not so like they are not monoculture. So it's a little bit more difficult to 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 identify and only with very high spatial resolution image, for example, from from uh, uh, maybe plan and now that it's free we can probably try to use but we still need a, a long term of image uh, but also drones for example so it's a, it's a big challenge in the community to try to identify the agroforest systems in in our community there in in Mozambique so follow we have two most important uh, um, um, let's say um, agroforest system which is the boundary system as you can see so they plant like a Let's say you can see like in the squares, like a, a square of trees, like making a wall. So the trees are next to each other, but they also have the dispersed interplanting in the Machamba. In the Machamba is the, is the property here of the person who is living there. So with this challenge, I mean, what could be the next approach? And then we thought that maybe we could work with trend analysis. So as we have a, such a huge time series for Landsat, we could do probably also a change uh, trend analysis. So try to identify if there was a difference in the in the NADVI in the pixel where the plant was, where, where the tree was planted. So in this case, you can see it's, it's very hard. We have a big challenge because here we only have two points within this pixel. But in some cases, we could have a good result because then we have more points of agroforest system. So more trees that are planted. So let's say that in 2002, the we have only the soil and then they plant the tree and probably in 2000 after 10 years depending on the species or eight years we can start to see an increase in the NADVI value so here for example is is a is a script that is just printed very very nice person uh, just printed he he was he does a, a amazing job with the google Earth engine was a was a making free and available for everyone. So to see kind of a trend in the NADVI. So here we did a test with one of the pixels. Uh, you can see in the graphics showing the NADVI values in the Y axis and in the in the X axis, you can see the ears. So we could see, let's say a trend in the, in the increase of the NADVI depending from where we get. But here we really have to take care because um, we have a strong seasonality in Savannah and and we, we really have to take care where we get from where we get the data. We know that the NDVI is very high sensitive for for uh, when after we, if we have a big burning, a big fire, uh, usually the regrowth uh, uh, can make also the NDVI increase. So what is increasing? So if we have an increase of the NDVI, what is the reason? It's because it do, there was a fire and now it's a regrow or it's because there was not a tree, it was only a soil, and now we have a tree planted in the agroforest system, and that's why we have an increase of the NDVI. And that's why we also decided to use the SAVI and also the NBR. And the results of this uh, mapping that we are still running are still not available <laughs> because we are still doing some tests. So if you want to follow up and to see the second task of this very interesting project, please, Follow us on, on Twitter. And if you have any question, I will be very, very happy to answer you. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Flavia. That was so much uh, wonderful information that you shared with us. Those visualizations are stark for both good news and bad news, aren't they? <laughs> 
we look to them for hope that we see that a, our actions have a have an impact. Yeah. Do we have any? Um, I'm just going to check and see if we've got any questions in the in the channel for you. I think a lot of people have been uh, spellbound by everything you're sharing. They haven't had a chance to type something in, and I'm seeing lots of uh, claps and thumbs up flying up through the through the public uh, venueless channel for you as well. <laughs> That's very nice. I really appreciate. I think it's, it's it's yeah. It's we are talking so much about climate change lately, right? And and that's such a great initiative that we can really try to to try to 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 protect the environment around of these areas, but also help the people who are living there, right? So economically, try to to develop the region and doing environmental initiatives, right? So that's. That's fantastic. I'm not seeing any questions pop up, so maybe I can ask one for you uh, myself. And that is, what do you want to do next? Yes. <laughs> so next, uh, um, I think it was very complicated when we started this agroforest mapping, as I said, because we have a problem with the spatial resolution, right? They are very small and with the land set, we cannot really identify and delineate all this agroforest system. So we have been trying to use harmonics. I have been trying to use, uh, for example, the backscattering and the texture from the Sentinel-1, which can give very good information to try to separate them. But none of this thing was very, um, let's say, enough to to really separate what is an agroforest system and what is a forest so that's also the problem right how you can differentiate an agroforest system to a forest so that's why i think the trend analysis is helping a lot so we can try to extract the phenology effect which the forest has of course in the savanna and trying to really um, uh, select and really see uh, the pixels where we have an increase of the ndvi not because of seasonality, but because we have a new tree there planted. So that's the next. And the task tree, it's the carbon storage, which will be even next of next. So <laughs> a little bit far. <laughs> Fantastic. We have a question for you about the ground truth thing. How was your ground truth data set built? And, and the visual photo interpretation or terrain data? Yes, yeah, so if I understood well, um, we we were doing a field work there, actually not me because of COVID, of course, our team in Mozambique, they were doing a field work last December to point out, uh, to try to take a GPS. We took, I think, 120 interviews with different farmers and 220 more or less agroforest system because it's very common that they have more than one agroforest system. They usually have two or three contracts even because it's uh, each agroforest system, it's one contract. And so, and then now that we have these points, then we know where exactly these agroforest systems are. So we can finally try to, um, to see if the behavior of the pixel where these forests are has a different, let's say, trend compared to the, the forest, which was always there, but has this phenology effect. And then for the carbon, we're going to do a few work, I think, next January or maybe December to try to do the, the field estimation of the biomass and carbon. And then we can do a correlation, of course, using different open source satellite image. For example, SAR has a very impressive um, um, probability of an uh, accuracy of uh, estimating biomass and so on. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to see if um, some of our previous speakers are still here and they'd be willing for me to add them back on stage. Greg, are you still here and able to join us? And Stephanie, are you still here and able to join us? We've still got Greg, fantastic. Stephanie might have needed to pop out or is uh, now watching from Venulus, even though she's still here backstage. Um, do you have any questions for each other? Okay, I think I have. <laughs> to Stephanie. Um, um, Stephanie, in my PhD, I was working with the fragmentation effect, so the edge effect. So it's well known that in the first 100 meters of a forest patch, we have a decrease of around 30% of the carbon and the biomass. 
And one of the things that we lack in the community is field work trying to see the impact of the, let's say, the, the fragmentation effect on the carbon and biomass. Because sometimes we do this relation between, of course, the field work and the satellite data. But if you don't get field data in these areas surrounding the fragment, you might be underestimating the fragment effect and also underestimating the biomass. So is there any